welcome. In the sometimes bitchy world of show business, it's hard to find someone who's universally liked by critics, public and fellow performers alike. They're harder to find than sunstroke victims in England. But there's one entertainer who fits the bill. It's difficult to find anyone with a bad word to say about him. Impossible to find a fellow pro who doesn't testify to his massive generosity, talent and good nature. He's got many aliases. In his early life, he was Ned Seagoon. More recently, reviewing one of his books, Prince Charles called him Ned of Wales. In reality, he's Harry Seacombe, and he's one of my guests tonight. Another of my guests is, unlike Harry Seacombe, a controversial figure. To many, he was and still is a political messiah, a leader with a rare vision of the new Australia. To others, he's simply the prime minister who will only be remembered because he caused the biggest constitutional crisis this country has ever gone through. He is Gough Whitlam. My third guest has been described as the best player in the world of the most difficult instrument in the orchestra, the French horn. An Australian, he's the world's only full-time solo horn player, a musician who has inspired a whole generation of composers to write for him. He is Barry Tuckwell. And then we've got a surprise guest, someone who's a particular friend of one of my other guests and someone who has an international reputation as a unique performer. You'll see him later on as you've never seen him before. So that's the lineup: Harry Seacombe, Gough Whitlam, Barry Tuckwell and Mr X. Join me after the break to meet Gough Whitlam. <laughs> The first guest tonight is certainly the most controversial and arguably the most charismatic leader in Australia's political history. In 1972, he led Labour to victory for the first time in 23 years, and he set in motion an unprecedented series of reforms. He also embarked on a career as Prime Minister, which was to end three years later in Australia's greatest constitutional crisis, when the then Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, sacked him and appointed Malcolm Fraser in his stead. Today, he stands outside the mainstream of politics, having embarked recently on writing a book about his years in office. Ladies and gentlemen, Gough Whitlam. So if I must ask you, on mature reflection now, what are the qualities you most admire about Sir John Kerr? <laughs> Not many people mention him to me, actually, but uh, in answer to your question, I'd have to say now, his sense of decency and staying out of the country. <laughs> <laughs> on mature reflection, what are the qualities you most admire about Malcolm Fraser? Oh, he's sticking there. He's staying on the burning deck. He is. <laughs> We'd go, go down with the ship like Mrs Thatcher. He, uh, <laughs> 12 ministers have left it already. <laughs> what about the, how would you characterise the difference in style of government between you and Malcolm Fraser? I think uh, Mr Fraser's intent on working out now uh, two of his earliest impressions. One was that uh, the country's prosperity depends on selling rural products to England, uh, and secondly, uh, it uh, depends on investment uh, from America. And those are his abiding, consistent principles. That is, you protect foreign owners of industries here, and at all costs, you preserve your European market, uh, markets. Is there any, any other change in style, too? I mean, um, what about his lifestyle at the lodge and that sort of thing? Has that changed since uh, you were there? Oh, it's much grander than our day. I mean, we had a plain bitumen drive. <laughs> he tore it up and replaced it with marble chips. <laughs> oh, but it, it also, he's made a few changes inside. Uh, I'm told, I haven't used it, uh, one of the <laughs> smallest rooms in the house uh, used to be a music room, that's what it was called. It was where you put the records uh, on for uh, the uh, system in other parts of the house. And I remember when uh, the Holtz took over from the Menzies, it wasn't working. So they sent the equipment off to be repaired and came back, and they found it would only play 98s. <laughs> 78s? 78s, uh, uh, I'm no. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then, uh, when the Frasers took over, they had none of that nonsense. They converted it into, into a, a toilet. Practical people. Yeah, practical people. Yeah, have they got music in the toilet? Pragmatic. Yeah. Pragmatic, yes. Like Harold Wilson. Now, <laughs> can we talk a little bit about your, about your background? Because um, 
your father was in fact Crown Solicitor of Australia, wasn't yes, he? Yes. Was he much of an influence on you? Oh yes, undoubtedly. Yes, in indeed. Well, I suppose he wanted me always to uh, look up and seek out the facts myself and come to my opinion on them. And uh, that is, he, he wanted you to form sound judgments uh, uh, based on facts. And what about your mother? Was she uh, a different kind of character or what? Oh, she was rather more an outgoing character than my father, I suppose. She was rather uh, a witty woman and uh, uh, would come out with some very light-hearted or even outrageous things. Although a serious person, you know, they, they were, they complemented each other very well. Very good secure background, if I may say so. A very in, comfortable background too, wasn't it? Uh, oh, well, I don't want you to get any impression that they were, of course, they were always comfortable, but they were never ostentatious mm. or over-affluent, but they, they were solid, sensible people and it meant that uh, we grew up in a in a secure uh, sur surrounding. Was there anything you didn't like about your childhood, about those surroundings? Very difficult for me to say. Mind you, my teens were spent in Canberra when it was a, had a population of about six or seven thousand. That is, if you wanted to go to an accountant or a solicitor or a medical specialist, you had to go to Queenbeer next door or to uh, Goldburn, which is about uh, 80 kilometres away. But I suppose you want me to express some grievance. No. <laughs> uh, only if you yeah, have yeah. one. <laughs> no, well, I suppose thinking over it, the only thing I resented was that my father used to make me go along to church on Sunday mornings. But once I went to university, he said, you're old enough to make up your own mind. So, of course, I never went again. Are you... A... <laughs> <laughs> you're not a religious person, then. I mean, how would you describe yourself? Now, I don't want to answer questions like this. I think it's terribly impertinent of you. I fell for it, for it once before. There was uh, uh, an English interviewer, uh, and he asked me, uh, was I a Christian? And uh, it was Lord Chalfont. Oh, yes. And he was doing it for the BBC. Now, whether it was BBC or because he was a lord or because he was said to be, he still was, I think, a member of the British Labour Party, I answered the question. And there were a few sermons on it afterwards and so on. Um, so uh, I wouldn't claim to be religious, no. Well, how do you answer the question that caused sermons to be written about it? Uh, he asked me if I was a Christian. And I suppose if you were to ask me now, I'd, I wouldn't answer it, of course. <laughs> but it's on the record. <laughs> so I said, uh, no, I'd be a fellow traveller of Christianity. Well, some church people are never satisfied. They were very upset that I didn't go the whole way. <laughs> now, what about these early days when you were at uh, school? There seems to be, in, in the background reading about you, some hint of uh, theatrical promise. Did you ever have any? I mean, what kind of, of, of stuff do you do that, that got you this reputation? Uh, well, at school, of course, there was the usual stuff. They'd go and have an annual play night or something in the local church hall, and I'd take part in that. But I suppose... Where that reputation comes from is uh, at university. I used to impersonate some characters of that period. Like what? Like who? Oh, I suppose Neville Chamberlain and Noel Coward. Very passe, of course. You know, I'm a very senior statesman now. Mm -hmm. This was before the war at the outset. Mm -hmm. You can't still do Noel Coward, can you? Um, better, probably, but I uh, know I can't. No, you're not going to, are you? No, I'm not. <laughs> Well, where See, did... this, this audience and uh, the listening, they wouldn't remember, Coward. Yes, they would indeed. <laughs> you, could, you could remind them. No, 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 I won't be tempted. All right. <laughs> what about the political ambition? I mean, it, again, there was no real no hint of, of that in your, in your early background. You seem to come fairly um, a bit later in, into that sort of ambition. Well, it, it was much later when I decided to do something about it. Right. That well, was during the war. But was there one, um, one thing that made you decide to do something about yes. it? Yes. Uh, during the war, uh, 1944, there was a referendum to give the federal parliament power for five years over all matters concerning post-war reconstruction. And the Liberals, uh, under Menzies, uh, said things completely opposite to what Menzies had been saying when he was wanting a referendum uh, seven years before. I supported it in them. I was outraged at uh, his uh, change of, uh, of uh, heart or... Uh, uh, that is, uh, I thought, you can't believe these people. You must get in, do something to set things right. And at that stage, that's in 44, I decided my next leave, I'd join up. And I did. 
When you went into politics, um, did you, from the very moment you entered, did you have ambition to reach the highest office, in other words, to be Prime Minister one day? No, it was quite a number of years before I thought that that was possible or likely or necessary. Um, it wouldn't have been until... See, I went into uh, House of Representatives at the end of 52, and it would have been in the late 50s before I came to realise uh, that uh, maybe I should be Prime Minister and was into the 60s before I realised, probably, that it's only if I became the leader of the Labour Party that uh, it would become the government. Why? Uh, we were very backward looking at that time. There were a lot of issues we hadn't tackled. And uh, so I thought uh, if there were issues which were correct but not understood, you had to fight for them. You had to do it consistently. If there are issues where, where we were wrong, you had to alter them. But what, and what I'm interested in is why you thought, why you had this sense that you were the person to do that and not anybody else. Oh, well, I don't particularly... I mean, there's comparisons and that sort of thing, which obviously I don't want to come into. But I, I think I came to realise that the issues that I was speaking about were ones that had to be implemented. They wouldn't be implemented until I became leader of the Labour Party and until it became the government. When you, when you were uh, Prime Minister, did you have a very a simple notion, an idea, of what you wanted for Australia? Oh, yes, for many years. See, I'd been in Parliament just 20 years when I was elected as the leader of the Labour government. And um, so, in that period, I'd been pretty diligent in working out a whole range of things that had to be done, which had accumulated and our predecessors hadn't done them, or which were being done else, elsewhere already, and which we had to do. So it was very clear what we would do, uh, what we believed had to be done. Was there one single image you had in your mind, though? One picture? Oh, what well, you oh, well, if I must... Uh, I suppose there are a couple of things. One was that we had to come to terms with our geography. Australia had to play her role in dealing with things in this region, from Japan and China, Papua New Guinea and the Pacific, Indian Oceans in general. Secondly, at home, we had to make it possible for everybody to have some equality of opportunity in things which were bound to come up for every family, like education, or could come up for every family, like health problems. And, of course, the whole question of the resource cities, which were in isolated areas, or the outer suburbs in every state capital, which were terribly short of all the things which elected people had to provide if they were to be provided at all. So those two things, external and internal. Right, well, we'll take a break there. We'll be back in a moment to talk some more to Gough Whitlam. See you in a moment. <laughs> Speaking with Gough Whitlam. Gough, you're writing this history now of your uh, years in, in office. Um, when, you, when you look back on those years leading up to, to 75, what kind of blame do you put on your own doorstep for, for the events that happened? Oh, well, clearly I ought to have been uh, more suspicious of some people, the various elements arrayed against us. Uh, also, I suppose I should have been tougher with some of my colleagues. I was too sentimental with some of them, yeah. Uh, but some of the, of the um, remarks made about you um, don't say that you were too sentimental. There are all kinds of things come up like... Oh, Arab... they would now. Compared with well, Malcolm, these... I was very soft. You were very soft. With colleagues, yes. yes. Yeah. But the, the words that are used about you at the time of arrogance, do you, do you uh, object to that term? or? No, I think uh, it goes with the job. They say that about most Prime Ministers, actually. I can't remember one. None in my time has not been so described, yes. but uh, I think uh, uh, it would be said with uh, less force about me now than it used to be. <laughs> On but a comparative they're... basis, you Oh, mean? yes, they've suffered worse. <laughs> <laughs> too much too soon, that you tried too much too soon. Uh, yes, that's often said. I, I, I don't accept that, although it, it may appear that way because we came across so much obstruction in the Senate and from the States that we often had to try to do something 
which we'd already explained for years before coming into office, we had to do it more than once in the effort to get it through. And so therefore, it looked as if we were forcing the pace. In fact, uh, we tried to do things which, and in fact, we, we did do an immense amount too, uh, but we achieved certainly more than half we, of what we tried to do. Mm. But really, these were things that not only had we explained and persuaded people about, but they needed to be done, and uh, no less today. We need to do the things which we were frustrated from doing. Did that period, uh, which must have been very, very dramatic and traumatic for you, did it uh, teach you anything about yourself, the events you went through? Uh, well, as I, as I say, I'd, I'd be more suspicious and I'd be more tough now. But, but yeah. what about the resilience? Do you find resilience in yourself? Because the world was suddenly oh, pulled I from under have, your feet. I, I, well, I obviously must have a degree of resilience. I wouldn't have lasted uh, uh, this long. I, in Parliament either, I wouldn't have lasted so long if I hadn't been fairly resilient. That's, mm. that's true. Mm. I mean, I, I, was, I was able to make out a pretty good case for everything we did or tried to do. But what's extraordinary is that you were hailed as the political messiah and swept in on a huge yeah. tide of good goodwill. And what seems like but a moment in time after that, you were booted yeah. unceremoniously out. Why yes, but I, I have no sense of rejection now. You don't? No, certainly not. I, I mean, again and again, I mean, you can't go around uh, without uh, realising that people thought we were right. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, despite the best efforts of our successors, it's taken them a long time to disband some of the things we did, such as Medibank. It took them six years to do it, to get rid of it. Mm. And uh, similarly, the, the school business do you feel a sense them a long of, time there. Do you feel a sense of violation when something like Medibank goes? Yes, yes, I do. But it's made it all the easier for the Labour Party now forthrightly to say that it will restore it. Mm. And also, it's become more and more clear in the intervening years that the federal government, which spends more on health than all the state governments together, must get its foot in the door of the hospitals, which are the greatest consumer of government funds for health, if there is to be a rational use of those funds. It was difficult in our day to persuade people that the federal government had to have some say in the running of hospitals. People now realise it. Mm. Uh, secondly, uh, I think people now realise that Medibank was ever so much more efficient than this host of private bureaucracies uh, which the private funds constitute. You, you of course, had survived the, that crisis and, and came through it unscathed, and you're looking remarkably well now, hale and hearty, because, I mean, you're a resilient man. To be a politician, you have to be. Yeah. But, of course, when you're in a situation like that, it's not only you cops, it, it's your family. I wonder, yeah. did, did it have any, any lasting effect on your family? Did, did, were they treated badly in any way? Um, I'd say uh, our, my, my wife and uh, my sons, uh, they, they survived it well enough, they're resilient enough. But there would be instances where I think our daughter suffered from it, yeah. In, yeah. What, in what, what instance? Can well, you tell she me was what? a well-qualified person, you know, had a degree and diploma as teaching. And, uh, as you know, there aren't enough jobs in the state system. And finally, I suppose, what was it, about 18 months ago, she was appointed to uh, uh, a school in the country. And uh, the local committee and uh, clergy, parents and that, were delighted to have her. She did have the qualifications. Then it went back to the head of the diocese and the bishop uh, uh, vetoed it. So, uh, On what but, grounds? Because, because of the name. Because of her surname. You were you told specifically that, were you? Uh, no, I, I'm, I wouldn't say it if I no, wasn't no, quite not. sure that yeah. it is accurate. Yes. The, the bishop, being a Christian, vetoed her because, <laughs> they, because she was a Whitlam. What was your reaction to that? Oh, well, she's now got a job which I think she likes much better. Oh, good. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, obviously that is disillusioning. Yes. And, uh, um, well, it, you know, I've said it factually, I suppose. That's upsetting, yes. But I, oh, I think all of us, including uh, my daughter, uh, are uh, resilient enough, yeah, yeah. I mean, I suppose partly uh, there's mutual support because, uh, in fact, we do see quite a lot of each other.
You didn't, of course, see a lot of each other, Margaret particularly, did you, in your first year in, uh, as Prime Minister? I mean... Uh, well, uh, we saw a lot of each other, but not... But in a social uh, sense. Alone. A lot, mm. Not alone. You, you, uh, you had much less time together uh, alone than uh, you would. Uh, that's true enough, yeah. Now, you mentioned earlier in the first part... I mean, she's, uh, you know, quite an extrovert person and so on, so she's used to company. She had been and so on, so... But nevertheless, it is true. It is true, I suppose. We were alone less. Did you work out how many times you, you had a meal together alone? Oh, I think uh, in the first year she worked it out, there were three occasions. Just three occasions. <laughs> Which is... Uh, it's grounds for divorce in anybody else but a politician or a prime minister. Yes, although we didn't contemplate, you know, <laughs> that long together, you might as well see it through. That's right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's more about the changing, mm, isn't that's it? Right, Absolutely. That's, right, that's right. You mentioned in the first part of this interview this vision you had for Australia. I think that's how she'd put it. She'd put it that way, yeah. yes. Um, do, do you see it, it um, that vision drifting away? No? the vision that you had from us first earlier? I mean, everyone uh, talks well, about... Well, certainly, uh, um, the waters were muddied a great deal, but I, I've no doubt that uh, uh, people uh, are coming more and more to see uh, not only the inevitability, but the great desirability of the things that we did externally and the things we did and were trying to do internally. I mean, nobody disputes that what we did externally was right. And there we were able to do it. it. The states or a senate elected years before, don't forget, mm. couldn't frustrate us what we, in what we did externally. Everybody sees that we made up lost ground and we charted a proper course for our country. Internally, it's more difficult to discern that, but more and more people are seeing now. Now, what about your own role now? Uh, because you're outside, really, of the mainstream of, of, yeah, yeah. of, of politics. But I'm do the you, elder statesman. The, you, do, yes. you don't object to that title, yet? Not in the least. I'm the only one, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Quite exclusive. But, but, <laughs> but what, what role do you see yourself playing there for as an elder statesman? Oh, there are many occasions uh, when I have some opportunity, I think, to have some influence at home or abroad. If I go abroad, uh, I see people at the same level as I did when I was head of government. Mm -hmm. uh, this year that has been the case in you know, several parts of the world. And uh, so I think I have, can have some influence there and probably at home where I choose. You know, I ration myself and these things usually. <laughs> <laughs> on these things? Well, on the opportunities uh, that uh, uh, where I'd... Uh, where I'd appear or make some pronouncement or utterance. We won't talk about rat bags then, will we? We won't talk about that. Look, <laughs> I... Fag it's the same station, of course, That's and I realise that... <laughs> no, sorry. I realise the Murdoch papers have to... have to... Eat their own. Pr ...pronounce, <laughs> the, you know, promote uh, any of these. I forgot about it the other night, you know. I was listening to the best news service on Australian TV, uh, Channel O, mm -hmm. at half time. <laughs> At, at half past seven, and too late I realised I'd missed myself. Yes, well, we, we, it was done three months before, you see, right. and I'd forgotten the damn thing. We can always arrange to have a, a playback for you, Goff, if you could face it, actually, that is. <laughs> so what is the, talking about regrets, what is the greatest regret of your political career, do you think, looking back? Oh, well, there are a lot of things that we... we were frustrated in achieving, mm. and I think we've all suffered... Uh, because of it, not just me, not just the party, but the country has suffered because those things were not brought about, I think. Mm. And what about this... I mean, you're, you're a historian, you're, you're interested in history. Do you think that you will go down in, in, in history as the, the, the Prime Minister who, who was at the centre of the greatest constitutional crisis Australia's ever had, rather than the man who radically changed the Australian way of life for a long, long time? Uh, I, I think the, the second one, I mean, I, I was the head of the greatest reforming government this country has had. But quite apart from that, I think the first thing you mentioned, the constitutional crisis, will make uh, my successors uh, uh, more uh, uh, suspicious of uh, uh, some of the people uh, with whom they have to contend, not only in high places, not only Governors-General and Chief Justices, 
But the legal and the medical profession and many vested interests, not least ones uh, from overseas. What do you mean by that? Oh, uh, the multinationals, you know, the, the people that I run our secondary industries here, yes, right, the, right. the ones that run our secondary industries, or the ones that determine the pace at the moment of uh, the exploration and exploitation of our mineral and energy resources. Um, you know, there's no doubt that a reforming government has to watch uh, what's being done by people overseas or at home uh, that will gang up against it. I suppose you could add newspaper proprietors, really. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back, though, on, on that period, on your, on your political career, but specifically the time when I you... I mean, and they're sometimes living overseas, too. Yes, yes, yeah, I, I, I have heard tell, yeah, actually, yeah, yes. Yeah. Do, do you get this sense of wasted opportunity? Ah, oh, no politician ever achieves all he wants to do. We achieved at least half of what we set out to do. And most of the other half that wasn't achieved will be. It'll have to be, I have no doubt about that. Where there's, there have to be changes to our electoral laws. There have to be changes to our industrial laws. There have to be changes to our transport system and our general governmental corporations. And we were trying to do all those. And finally, could, could I ask you, do you see that you have any place at all to play, any part to play in, in, in uh, Australia's political future? Oh, well, I don't exaggerate what I, what I uh, can do, but uh, I have some influence on issues. I, I uh, very largely on, on uh, general, uh, on ex uh, international affairs, and also quite a number but of internal issues. But could you see yourself back in the mainstream again? No, no, no. Oh, I'll, I'll be 65 next month. And I've always taken the attitude that if politicians make public servants get out at 65, they should get out themselves at 65. And uh, uh, really, uh, I was 11 years as head of my party, the longest that anybody ever has been, seven years as deputy leader and carrying a lot of the burden then. So I made a fair contribution there. But no, I think you get out while the going's good. And there are a lot of things that Margaret and I really ought to be doing now that we missed out on doing all those years of public service because she gave public service as well as me uh, that uh, well we can enjoy ourselves a bit more doing some of the things that we want to do. Gough Whitlam thank you very much indeed. Gough Whitlam. <laughs> uh, we'll uh, be back in a moment to talk to Harry Seacombe. See you in a moment after this break. Welcome back. My next guest tonight is one of the best loved and most versatile performers in all of show business. In a lifetime as an entertainer, he's done everything from radio to feature movies, pantomime to musicals. He's also a writer of some talent and with several best selling books to his name. And he's also sending me up rotten over there. <laughs> Indeed, one of his books was reviewed by no less a person than Prince Charles, who gave him the title Ned of Wales. Ladies and gentlemen, Harry Seacombe. It's kiss than the worst would stare When your fingers touched my silent heart And taught him how to sing Yes, true arms of any splendid thing
Michael. Nice to be with you all, Michael. Uh, <laughs> the golden voice. Uh, fine voice. Fine voice. You know, he nearly died 18 months ago as well, this fella. Had the lurker, you know. He had the lurker. <laughs> no, he did, seriously. Yes. It, what, what, were you coming back from here? Coming back from here, yes. I was at, uh, I was at Twin Towns. I've been working there for the week. It's up near uh, on the border, you know. Mm -hmm. And I had a bad stomach. I wasn't quite sure what was, what was wrong with me. And I got the play to Barbados, because I was there doing that for Christmas, and all the family had gone. So I thought, I, I wouldn't see the doctor in case there's something seriously wrong with me. I'll get to Barbados first. Right. <laughs> and then uh, be sick with all the family, you know. <laughs> we'll all sit around and watch it throb. So... <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out to be... I had uh, what they call... Uh, uh, diverticulitis, Welsh disease, you know. <laughs> what is Actually, that? Actually, the colon had punctured. Good Lord. It, and uh, and uh, it came to a full stop. <laughs> I was suffering from punctuation. <laughs> you get it wrong, you're saying. So it was a dangerous, a dangerous thing. And you, you were operated on in, uh, in, in Barbados, Barbados weren't yes. you? A second opinion from which doctor? <laughs> Did you think it might affect the old vocal cords? Well, it was, yes. It was rather low down the scar, was it? Yeah. But everything's all right now. <laughs> Good. When, in fact, did you first realise you got this, this loud voice? Well, my grandmother had an outside dunny. <laughs> or Lou, as we call him in Wales. And uh, it had no door, you see. So you had to sing loudly <laughs> to keep your privacy. And I just uh, sit there. So come back from, I was in the choir as a kid, a choir boy. I took my voice broke and took a stained glass window with it. <laughs> I wish this, uh, I was just sit out there, because I was too shy to sing in front of the family. So I had to go sit, sit out there and, and uh, in the winter even and sing Abide With Me and all a selection of hymns. In the toilet? In the toilet, yes. <laughs> I was sat there, square to the news of the world, stuck on a nail. That's right, yes. Couldn't Very afford the paper in those well, days. No, you couldn't. Good no, heavens, no. Not. Did you, in fact, have operatic training? Yes, I studied for 12 years. It was a waste, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I made a record uh, before I ever had any training at all. And then the, somebody said to me, you better go and get your voice trip before you lose it, because I was singing it, singing the wrong keys and everything. So I want to see a fellow called Manlio de Verily, who was a marvellous old teacher, uh, a friend of Gili's, who's dead now, which just as well, and, um, <laughs> and a few... Uh, other famous tenors, and he, he took me in hand and took my voice apart. And uh, very good, actually. He, I always remember the first time I went to see him, because somebody said to me a story about Caruso. The first time Caruso was taken to see uh, Puccini, you know, a friend took Caruso to see Puccini. Puccini was at his piano in this, in this villa in Rome, and there was this lovely curly-haired youngster standing there in the sunshine. And he said to Caruso, sing for me. So he played, Caruso sang, and he stopped after the scale and said, who sent you to be God? He said to Caruso, with this in mind, you see, I went to my first singing lesson. <laughs> I saw this fella, do verily, and he sat at the piano. It was raining at the back of Marble Arch, it was. <laughs> <laughs> my hair was curly in the rain. And he said, sing for me, and I sang, and he stopped playing, he said, good God, who sent you to me? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about the, the thing, though, because I, uh, whenever I watch you singing beautifully, singing an aria, I, I expect you to cross your eyes, actually, halfway through or something. Well, You've yes. You've done that from time to time. I, I have done. I've fallen my back as well. Yes. I have a back condition on a flat head. <laughs> but he did say to me, after about ten years of training, he said, please, Harry, don't go cross-eyed in the middle of the aria, he said. Piccini was up all night writing that aria, he said. <laughs> Give him some consideration. <laughs> So can, now I tend not to do that. Can we crawl a little bit, uh, the two uh, Brits here, about cricket for a moment? Oh, yes. Because it won't have passed your notice, will it, that, in no. fact, we, we stuffed the Australians. Uh, yes, it yes. was rather nice. Is it, what what time is that? That's the Lord's Taverner, That's the Lord's Taverner. You're, you're Lord's I'm the Lord's Taverner, yes. Well, I'm the president, as you know, this you're year. The yes, yes. Have you ever played against the Australians in your capacity? Uh, I did once, um, a few years ago at Melbourne. Ken Bunnington, oh, blessed memory, lovely old Ken, mm. and, and Colin Cowdery came to me and said, he was the last test at Melbourne, he said the things hadn't been going too well, publicity-wise, with, with the two teams. So uh, he said, come down the nets before the, the last day and just uh, have a few balls from the lads. He said, Lily and, and uh, Thompson will bowl a few balls and get the photographers there and, and make a bit of a giggle of it. I said, fine. So I won pad and no box. 
I'm standing in the nets. <laughs> I, don't, oh, I don't bat very well. And I got my glasses on. I was standing there. And Lily was fine, because he bowls quite nicely, gently, and I played a few down. I said, it's not bad. And, it and then Thompson came along. And he bowls like a javelin thrower, because he can't... <laughs> he, doesn't, he didn't take any sort of run. He just took a step and then threw the ball at me. And it caught me in the inside of the thigh. And I did go up an octave. <laughs> <laughs> and he bowled me a half a dozen balls. And I was in panic-stricken. I couldn't do anything but laugh, you know. <laughs> and I couldn't walk for about two days after. Oh, it's, it's oh. Have you faced any other fast bowlers? Because the... Oh, I have. Yeah. I mean, the thing is that when you play these charity games, you come against the really good pros, don't you? Unfortunately, yes. Sometimes they, they, they play the game, other times they, they don't. Now, Freddie Truman was once... Uh, on the same side, I was betting against. I, I captained the, the Prime Minister's eleven, Harold Williams' eleven, oh, yes, yes, yes. against a Len Hutton. Right, right. <laughs> Tall, thin fellow with glasses. <laughs> 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 so that was, uh, I was uh, batting, as Colin Milburn was batting the other end. And when we ran between the wickets, it registered seven on the Richter scale. <laughs> 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 Truman decided to take the ball and bowl to me. So Len Hutton called all the team behind the wicket. There was nobody in the field at all, all behind the wicket. And Fred went to the boundary, and I stood where I was. I thought, oh, Fred, I've known Fred for years. <laughs> He's come drinking with me at the Palladium. He wouldn't, wouldn't bowl at me like that. Not much. <laughs> so I'm still standing there, and he starts to run, and he runs all the way from the boundary. And I'm still going, good old Fred. <laughs> <laughs> he dropped the ball, Fred. <laughs> My boxes are on my knee, you know. <laughs> but he bowled, he bowled a full toss onto my boot. <laughs> so hard, it went for four. <laughs> Look at them, nobody to stop it. All went to the boundary. And I couldn't walk, and I was carried off the field. Old friend went, ah, that choke, you did that, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're take a break, though. We'll be back in a moment to talk some more. Tell us if you Yes, to Harry Seekham and Gough Whitlam. Harry, in fact, your first ambition was to be a journalist, wasn't it? Yes, it was, yes. Yeah. I, was, uh, I remember getting a rejection slip at the age of seven. Really? <laughs> For what? I wrote a poem, uh, which had cribbed, really, from, from, uh, from another poem. <laughs> <laughs> Unconsciously, you know, unconscious plagiarism. I sent it to the, to the Daily Express and sent a nice little letter they sent back saying I uh, couldn't use it, you know. But yeah. I was quite proud of the fact that I'd had something with a Daily Express notepaper. Were you encouraged at school to be to be a writer? Yes, we had a fellow called Mr. Caulfield. It was it was a very good English teacher, and, and uh, he always wanted me to be a writer all the way through school. He said, "One day you're going to be a journalist." And when I left school, I went to the army and things. So. And I always remember going back to see him. He'd retired by this time. He was living in a place called Calais, just outside Swansea. And at this time, I'd, I'd been at the Palladium, top of the bill, and all the, all the trappings of success, you know, the Crombie overcoat and the Trilby and the, and the flash car. And I turned up to see him outside his house, went in, and there he was sitting by the fire, an old man with his rug over his knees. And I said, hello, Mr. Caulfield. He said, Harry, what went wrong? You write you write books now as well as write for Punch and magazines like that. You write well, novels. So do you. I mean, yeah. We meet at Punch lunches, don't we? We do indeed. Very, very, they're always better when you're there. There's always <laughs> But where do you fact do you find it easiest to to write? Because you have a very very busy life. Do you have an area somewhere where you go and write or what? Yes. Well, I've got a, a, a place in Mallorca, which uh, is my little bolt hole, and uh, I find writing that easy because I've got no phone. Well, mm. carrier pitch is very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I find I can just sit and, and, yeah. and write without any sort of uh, interference. And the locals don't bother you at all. No, they call me El Gordo. El Gordo. The fat one. <laughs> <laughs> But funny, I can't, I can't speak Spanish. I can speak a reasonable amount of Italian, because I, I can sing Italian. Yes. I, I'm, I generally have to go into the, when I go to the shops, <laughs> to order uh, to the butchers, for example. I'm a great, I'm a cabaret. And the, here he comes, you know, he'll go, he's fat with me. Because <laughs> I have to say, for a leg of lamb, it's, bah! <laughs> 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 for chicken, and, uh, and it's, <laughs> for, I haven't ordered any sausages yet. <laughs> <laughs> Stick to bacon. Because you, you've, I think I'm right in saying that you've not written, well, you've certainly not written um, 
a book about the war, have you, like your dear friend Mr Milligan? <coughs> He's made more money than the war than crops. <laughs> 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 Do you have one planned? Well, I'm, uh, I shall be writing my autobiography sometime around, I suppose, before I pop off. <laughs> and there'll be a few chapters in there about Milligan. About Milligan? Oh, yes. Of course, yes. you met him there, didn't you? I the first met him in, in, uh, in North Africa in 19, 1943. He was in a 7.2 gun howitzer uh, regiment. I've told the story a few times, actually. Mm. And um, we were at the foot of a cliff at this place called... Uh, was it? Took a burr somewhere. Anyway, in, in the middle of the Tunisian mountains, and we had a, a little command post in a truck at the bottom of this cliff. And these uh, big guns, huge guns, had just come in at night time, and we dug the, the holes for them, the gun pits, and we hadn't dug them to the proper specifications. So it was a night occupation, and this, this, these guns came in, <clears throat> and the, they decided to fire one gun on a lanyard, calibrating round a lanyard. It's at night time, so. This huge gun with big hydraulic and huge wheels. So they, they fired, and when they turned around, the gun had gone. It bounced out of the out of the gun pit and came straight over the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> and it missed us by a few inches at, at, at the at the bottom, bottom of the cliff of the truck. And down it went, and, and first impression was if they're firing guns at it, this time we packed it in. <laughs> <laughs> the German word for surrender, and I've always, <laughs> always liked Hitler and things like that. And the back flap of the truck opened up, and his face appeared. He said, anybody seen a gun? <laughs> <laughs> that was him. You were the, we, we described yourself once, I remember, in a, in a short story that you wrote about the army, as being the regimental idiot. I was. I'm afraid I was, yes. In what way? Well, I was always a clown. I always did shows, you know, for the army and for the, for the regiment. And there was a specific time when Montgomery came to uh, in invite us to join, whether we liked it or not, the Eighth Army. We were the First Army, and in Seuss, before the invasion of Sicily, there was a big parade, and all the regiments lined up in parade. And along comes Monty in his open car, fly whisk, and everything. And we were in a sort of open square, and he drove it. He said, "Get the one, wake ranks, get the one." So we all rushed, and I was pushed right underneath him. <clears throat> right underneath him. And at this time, we'd been on compo rations for six months. No fresh fruit, and I was all covered in boils and, and things. <laughs> and my glasses had broken about 14 times, and I'd repaired them with, with wire, you know, with, with, with adhesive tape. <laughs> so I'd grown used to looking like that. <laughs> and he said, off. I want to see what your chaps look like. So he took, I got my belly off, and all the hair fell down in the front. I had a haircut for ages, and it was all. So I'm underneath him like this. So he's saying things like, Now you chaps have uh, left the First Army, a damn good job, First Army. Now you're coming to be the Eighth Army, and you're going to be a spearhead for the new invasion of. Uh... And he caught sight of me and he went, <laughs> and I kept going, yes, sir. <laughs> and there was, there was a sort of, sort of uh, a lull in the thing as he, 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 he couldn't quite think of what he was doing. And I felt impelled to fill this gap by saying, We're with you, sir. <laughs> uh, and he looked down and he said, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we should have won, you know. <laughs> what about humour in Parliament, Goff? Is there, any, <laughs> is there a, a, in your experience, <coughs> has there been much room for it there? <laughs> in the House? Oh, it's quite some years ago since there were any untoward incidents of that. <laughs> the one I always remember is that there was uh, uh, a member, Bill Wentworth, who uh, had an obsession about communists, you know, under the bed and the chair and everything. <laughs> And uh, was always in full flight, uh, full moon sort of thing. And uh, one of uh, our characters uh, dressed up in a, got one of the waiter's coats from the bar, put it on, just slid up beside him and said, the, the wagon's outside, sir. <laughs> <laughs> completely unparliamentary conduct, but of course, it completely threw and discredited Wentworth, you know. <laughs> 
that's lovely. What about yourself, Harry? Um, this this business that you have, I mentioned in the introduction to you. <laughs> that um, I mean, you, you you're immensely happy, jolly person. I mean, is that a, a real strain? Well, no, I'm an idiot, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no strain, but an idiot for. No, I'm I'm going pretty to be happy, but I, you know, I'm doing something I like doing. I'm not forced to work in a factory or anything. Yes. And. Uh, I've got a happy home life, and I think that's very important in our business. Yes. So, uh, I'm going to have to take the carp apart. Oh, hey! Can I, well, can, I, can, I, can I ask you on a slightly more serious note, too? Yes. Because um, since you last were, were in Australia, I think, um, of course, old Peter died. Oh, yeah. 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 And, uh, I mean, I will talk, ask you this sort of obvious question about it, but you, you went along <laughs> to the funeral, didn't you? Yes, I was at the funeral, which was quite uh, a bizarre affair, because it was the worst thunderstorm for years in London at that time. You know, at, at the time of the of the, uh, the ceremony, and there were lots of lots of people outside. You know, mm. at this uh, gold as green it was, a rose red city half as gold as green, and there were so many people there, and all these uh, photographers, and this terrible thunder and lightning, and only a few of us were allowed into the <coughs> into the actual chapel. Mike Bentine and Spike and myself, we were all sitting together, and Father Hester, the Baptist Church Union. Chaplain gave the address and said uh, at the end of it, before they committed the, the body for burial, that, that uh, Peter would like uh, a certain piece of music played <coughs> at the time of committal. And we all sat back waiting for something like a Bach fugue or something. And it was Glenn Miller in the mood. <laughs> <laughs> and we all looked at each other with wild surmise, not knowing whether to laugh or not. <laughs> and it was very strange whether, whether it was a Spike thinks it was a, one of Peter's jokes mm. from from the grave, but um, I don't know. It, it's all very confusing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about what about yourself now? You're over here in Australia. And you're you're playing around. Where about you going? Um, uh, where am I going? Port Macquarie on on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, then down to uh, the Parramatta mm -hmm. uh, on Saturday and Sunday. And then up, up to Queensland, up in the sun. You like it up there, don't you? I like it, yeah, I like it yeah. anywhere. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sure you do. Lovely part of the world. And the nice thing is that people like you wherever you go. Harry Seeker, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Harry Seeker. <laughs> right, we'll be back in a moment to hear the world's hardest instrument played by the man called the master magician of the French horn, Barry Tuckwell. Back in a moment. My next guest tonight plays an instrument described variously as the wild beast of the orchestra or the treacherous monster of the brass. The instrument is the French horn and it's acknowledged as the most difficult instrument in the orchestra. My guest started to master it at the age of 13 in his native Melbourne. At 15 he was playing French horn in the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, become the youngest player they'd had. From then on he moved to England, became the first horn player for the London Symphony Orchestra and later embarked on a career as the world's only full-time solo horn player. In his time, he's inspired many composers to write works especially for him, but not the tune he's going to play for us now. This is written by Jerome Kern, with never a thought that one day it might be played by the world's master French horn player. The tune, the evergreen, Why Do I Love You, to play it, Barry Tuckwell.
Is that exhausting? For you, <laughs> Mr. Seacombe, Mr. Whitlam, Sir. young man with a horn. Um, if it was such a difficult instrument, why, did, in fact, did you choose it as a, as a child to play it? I didn't choose it. It chose you, did it? <laughs> it was presented to me. Was it? <laughs> I was what is called as musical, and they despaired. I mean, they mean, being my parents. Yeah. I think they did anyway. I certainly despaired because I didn't think I was good enough at the piano or the organ or the violin, which I studied, to be a performer. And a friend of the family said, look, he's musical, he must be good at something, try this. And that's how I started. I see. Mm. And why is it such a difficult instrument to play? What's the reason? Oh, look, I think every instrument's difficult. Uh, this, perhaps, is the most treacherous. Well, well, I've got to say something about it being difficult, because we all want to be uh, seen to be doing something very special. Yeah. But it is a treacherous instrument, because the design of the contour of the flare of the tubing, which produces this beautiful sound, makes it actually quite inefficient acoustically. You can improve it, you can make it a different flare, a different shape mouthpiece, and all that sort of thing. Yeah. But then it ends up sounding like another instrument. How much tubing you got there, in fact? Oh, How I like... don't know. I've never measured it. I, I've been told it's about 200 inches. Uh -huh. Now, you in, fact, you, in fact, can play anything, can't you? Um, and you can play what we've got down here. We've got a tube oh, of... Uh... It so happens, yes. Yes. Because <laughs> I happen to bring this because I think it's a very graphic way of <coughs> showing that uh, you can get a tune out of any piece of tubing. Right. And all brass instruments are just a piece of metal tubing. They're That's all right. the same. They're just uh, bent in different ways. And this is a piece of just ordinary garden pipe? What it appears to with be. With a funnel at the end. Yeah. Here we are. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Right. But we're going to play on this. Well, see if you recognise the tune. I said it's a bit it's rusty. Very good. Marvellous. <laughs> is it in fact that? Is that a very old instrument? No, this is very new. This is my pride and joy. No, I meant the instrument itself. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to tell you who made it. No, the instruments are actually this year. Uh, celebrating its 300th birthday. Um, that is from its transition from the hunting field into inside where it was played initially just a sort of as a hunting instrument to mix in with various operas. Yes. But it graduated into being a very respectable instrument. And in the 18th century, the horn virtuosos were real kings. Yes. Yeah. Well, 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 how, was the diff uh, how was the instrument different when it was first... Uh, um made? Uh, just only the vowels only in as much as it didn't have this plumbing on it. I see. Uh, I think it's commonly thought that these things make the instrument easy to play. A brass instrument's only a bugle. They're all the same. You can do... Yes. And uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, these things were stuck on, which added extra length of tubing. So you went... You played your bugle call in different keys, that's all. How demanding is it, is it physically to play? I only think it's tiring for the face. Obviously, you have to be careful that you don't lose your teeth, and that you... What, what happens if you lose your teeth? Well, the mouthpiece goes through to the back of the neck. <laughs> 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 That's you go daft dancing, don't you? <laughs> but no, I mean, can't you wear false teeth? Yes, but it's difficult. Is it? So I'm told. Is I haven't it? tried it yet. No, no, no. no. <laughs> but, it, it, I mean, it is reckoned to be the most physically demanding, isn't it? Why is oh, that? I'm glad you said that. No, I feel very strong. <coughs> uh, well, let me put it another way. Most French horn players, in fact, reckon at the age of 50, which you are now, that yeah. that's retirement age, don't they? I think that if you play a wind instrument, and in particular a brass instrument, you should assume <coughs> that at the age of 50, which I happen to be, uh, you should be looking for uh, a, a downgrade in your ability to play. Yes. yes. And do you, do you feel that now? No, I'm getting stronger. You're getting better and better. <laughs> How is it that you're different, then? I don't think I'm different. I think perhaps I'm lucky. I, I gave a concert uh, three weeks ago in London, my 50th yeah. birthday concert, in which I played in every number, and it ranged from as a solo instrument to uh, playing in an obligato with a singer and uh, chamber music, and ended up playing Jerome Kern. Yes. And I felt stronger and stronger as the night went on. Mm. You know, of course, <coughs> you're conducting now, aren't you? I mean, is that a kind of insurance against retiring as a, as a home player or what? Oh, certainly not. No, not. no, no. I never... Well, I won't say I'm never going to give this up. I don't believe in the words always and never. Uh, but I just think of conducting as an extension 
of being a musician. Is it, is it better, I mean, or is it more difficult to be a, a conductor after you've been a player yourself? I mean, do you see the tricks of the trade? Well, yes and no. You, you can be aware of all the tricks that are going to be played upon you, but on the other hand, to have been a player means that you know the business very much from the inside. What sort of tricks do they play upon you as a conductor? I can only tell you the tricks that I played, and that was to disobey instructions to be asked to play a little bit louder or a little bit softer, and then not to do it, to see if the uh, demand was uh, asked again. Is and, the, you know, if it wasn't, you'd won. Yes. Is the conductor therefore really necessary? Well, I used to think of the conductor alternately as somebody who I admired or I despised. But I remember the fourth horn in the London Symphony Orchestra saying to me when I joined, uh, the first thing you must remember is the conductor is your mortal enemy <laughs> and if you remember that you'll get along fine yes yeah. you do an awful lot of touring don't you you travel what's something like 200,000 miles a year I think mm -hmm. I'm right I'm right mm -hmm. saying yeah. you have to practice with the instrument one one assumes daily where, where, where do you practice I put the television on in a hotel room in a hotel room I put the television on because people don't like to hear you practicing but if you put the television on loud, they like to hear that. They think that that's fine to hear a Western or a quiz show or something. So I put the television on, put the mute in, and play quietly and do all my exercises, and it's fine. And I learn a lot of commercials. I play with them. <laughs> <laughs> are there any, any programs that are better than others to record over, to practice over? Loud, loud programs are good. So you need a lot of laughter. Quiz yeah. shows, or Parkinson shows, very good. <laughs> <laughs> and, again, yeah. and what about the other hazards of touring? I mean, what, what, what are they? Because, I mean, I suppose you live out of a suitcase, don't you, all the time? Yes, I think the problem is uh, you don't always take what you should take. And I had an experience in Milan, where I went to play and recital, and I found I'd left half my gear behind. I didn't have the right um, equipment. I didn't have the right tie or the waistcoat or anything. And, uh, uh, I eventually had to fake it up with um, uh, a paper napkin, which I happen to have from the flight. I happen to have one with me now. It's funny you should ask me that question, <laughs> which is British Airways. Uh, but I folded <laughs> it over very carefully so that it didn't look like British Airways and made a tie. Uh, and I got a cummerbund, which I made out of the tie from, the, uh, from the, a towel from the hotel. And I've travelled British Airways ever since because they have white ones. Qantas have coloured ones. <laughs> <laughs> Right. OK, well, we've got to take a break, though. We'll be back in a moment to talk some more to Barry Tuckwell and to Harry Seekham and Gough Whittle. We'll be back in a moment. <laughs> Welcome back, my guests, Gough Whittle, Harry Seekham and Barry Tuck Tuckwell. And in a moment, of course, we'll be meeting our special mystery guest. Um, in fact, how precocious a talent were you as a, as a child? Well, I remember that I could read music before I could read words. Mm. I was more interested in music. Mm. And I can remember standing beside the piano, sort of this high, hitting notes and listening to the overtones of the strings. So I suppose I was always fascinated by sound. And you, you come from a very musical family, don't you? Mm -hmm. I mean, your father, he's how old now? Well, he was... I asked him to come to the show this afternoon, and he said, no, I can't come, I've got three weddings to play. And I said, well, I hope you can watch the show. And he said, no, I'm too busy. I'm playing at the Roseville Theatre. He's 80. He's 80. Yes. <laughs> He's still earning a living. He's busy. And yeah. what about your, your son? Because you've got a boy of, what, seven, have you not? Yes. Is he, is he musical at all? <clears throat> I think he is. He tells me he isn't, but I think he is. Yes. yes. Does he have uh, problems about uh, school and, and, and adjusting to that? Because you had the problems, didn't you, at school? Well, I'm not supposed to say this because he might be watching. I see. But certainly, yes, I think I had trouble at school because I was smarter than the teachers. <laughs> Musically speaking, or generally? Generally. Oh, generally yeah. speaking. <laughs> oh, I see. And you got expelled, did you not, at 15? Only twice. Only twice. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Harry? Because you were... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did you have any academic record at school at all? More of a long player. No, I didn't. Uh, I didn't do very well at anything. I wasn't bad at English and, and languages, but I remember after the, uh, the matriculation exam came out, I had no marks at all for maths. None at all. I remember the teacher reading out the... Uh, he held up my paper up between his two fingers. <laughs> so we have history here, he said. The boy in this form has made history. Stand up, Siku. I knew you'd see. No marks for maths. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Took 
fool. The boy's a fool, he said. I was. <laughs> what, what about you, Goff? You seem like the kind of man who took, took all the glittering prizes. Would that be right at school? No, I, as I said to you earlier, when I was at school in the teens, it, I went in a very small town, Canberra, you know, six or seven thousand people. But I was transferred from one school to another because of conduct, yeah. Because of conduct? Well, the headmaster rang up, uh, one, it was a co-educational school, I was 15, and uh, one of the teachers, uh, uh, female teachers, complained that I was being cheeky. So uh, the headmaster rang up my father, and uh, who called in and uh, heard the complaint, said, right, I'll transfer you to the boys' school, the grammar school, you see, so... But the, the, uh, uh, the female teacher concerned, uh, uh, I'm the greatest friend uh, with her and her family now, but I, I suppose, without meaning to, she was the cause of me being transferred from one school to another when I was 15. Mm -hmm. Let's talk to you all, also, the three of you two, about, about image as well and about criticism, because all three of you have been in the public spotlight <laughs> and all three of you have copped it from time to time. Except with you, Harry, I suppose, because, but, again, but, I mean, have you ever, ever been badly criticised? Uh, universally by... liked. Yeah. Uh, universally <laughs> liked, yes. Not, not, not no. be liked to be loved, I yes. Got... Belted. I remember playing Bolton, doing the shaving act at Bolton. I used to do an act of the way people shave. And it went very badly. It was Wakes Week at Bolton. The place was packed. And I went on doing the shaving act, and they didn't get a laugh. Nothing. And then I did my impression of Jim McDonald and Nelson Eddy singing, Sweetheart, Sweetheart, Sweetheart. <laughs> All that sort of <laughs> clever ad living I was doing. And I walked up the stage to the sound of my own footsteps. I went to the bar for a drink, because I needed a and the fella paid me out. The bloke who owned the theatre paid me out. He said, you're not shaving my bloody dime. He's there. <laughs> <laughs> and I got paid off. Yes. And the paper, the newspaper reporter, in the paper the following day, suggested I should have put a blade in the razor and finished the job off properly. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Barry? Have you had bad reviews like that? It must be something about the north of England. But I played in Liverpool. It must have been about four years ago. And I poured my heart and soul into a performance of Mozart the Concerto, and I thought I'd done very well. The critic in The Guardian, I won't tell you his name, I've told you everything else, said that I played in such an offhand manner that he wondered why I bothered to make the journey to Liverpool. Oh, charming. And I threw this away, and I thought, I'm, you know, so angry. I wish I'd kept it, because I would have put it in the loo, or the dunny. Yeah. 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 What about you, Goff? Yeah. Well, in, in all your years of, uh, of office in... in, in uh... Oh, I've, been had, I've had plenty of criticism in the media about what I've said. Yes. But the audience has always loved it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But is there anyone stands up? <laughs> Perhaps, I mean, when you were on the hustings and that sort of thing, somebody, somebody said to you, you know, when you were making a speech or whatever. I can remember a couple of squelches. Um, I remember, oh, some years ago, um, our, our member for the district retired and there was a, a new candidate and I was up there to introduce him. And, of course, in these circumstances, you always emphasise whatever points you have in common with him. It was up in Darwin, which is a pretty ochre area, and uh, I was talking about this chap, and I said, of course, we were born in the same year, in fact, in the same month, and uh, same city, same suburb, actually. And somebody interjected, same father? <laughs> <laughs> That's not nice, is it? Oh, no. So what do you say in answer to that? You, you take it in good part, and I'm... Um, uh, terrible thing to have said about my father, but uh, nevertheless, <laughs> I think you would have been amused. Yeah. Let's also talk to you a little bit, too, about... I mean, Harry, you mentioned you've been married now for, what, 38 years now, haven't you? But, uh, not 38, no, I've married 1948. Seems that. Seems that, yeah. 35 years. 35 years yeah. you've married, which is a bit unusual in our game, isn't it? Well, I suppose it is, really, but, you know... God, I'm 39. 39, yeah. You know? Last month, 39. If you find a model you like, stick to it. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you meet the missus? Well, I met her at a dance in, uh, down the Mumbles Pier in Swansea. And I made arrangements to meet her afterwards, because I'd had a few drinks with the boys, you see, and it was a bit dark after the dance, and I wasn't quite sure what she looked like. So I arranged to meet her at 6 o'clock outside the Plaza Cinema the have following a night. Look. Yes, have a good look. So I got there early, so I got there at 10 to 6, I got behind a pillar, because outside the Plaza Cinema there are all sorts of pillars. So I got behind a pillar at 10 to 6, I thought, well, when she turns up, and if, it, if she looks a bit duff, I won't, I won't bother. <laughs> I went to quarter past 6, didn't see her, I came up from behind my pillar, and she came up from behind hers. <laughs> 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 uh, 
How much of a strain marriage does all this touring put on, on, on a relationship in, in, in a marriage? I mean, if you're away oh, from home all the time. Enormous. I, enormous. I, it makes life very difficult. I, I said to my wife once, I think when I come home, I'd like to have a telephone, both sides of the, of the bed, because I'm more used to talking to you over the telephone than I am in person. Yes. No, it's very difficult. It's, it's a real problem. Yes. Yeah. But you don't ever feel like giving it up. I mean, yes. They, yes, you yes, do, I do, do you? Yes, I hate travelling. I hate air travel. It's not glamorous. It's uncomfortable. And I don't recommend it at all. I'm sorry about all that stuff about British Airways, but I don't recommend any of them. <laughs> and yet you travel 200,000 miles a year. You must be a masochist. On this station, you travel answered. All right. <laughs> <laughs> We'll take a break there. Is this? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back in a moment to meet Miss, Mr. X of Clue. Well, he's a musician, actor, writer, poet, humorist, campaigner, recently elected mayor of Woi Woi. Find out who he is after this break. See you then. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, a very special guest, a man who's led a small New South Wales town and thrust it into the forefront of modern metrolops. A thinker, a philosopher, and a true leader of men, the mayor of Woi Woi, Mr. Terence Maligna. Who's the keeper here, then? <laughs> oh, yes, sir. Uh, what's your name? Uh, Parkinson. What a good memory you got. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, my name's... Oh! <laughs> I've got a touch of the, the old metric miles. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, uh... <laughs> You've got the bird. My name... Oh, she brought the old spittoon then. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Malcolm. Uh, my name is uh, my name is uh, Richard Scratcher. <laughs> Very rarely referred to as Dick. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the uh, the uh, chairman of the Ladies Woi Woi District League of Decency and Chuck Farmers. <laughs> and uh, we're uh, very. Uh, very dissatisfied with, uh, <laughs> with some of the guests that you have on this program. Who? <laughs> like who? Well, like you, for instance. <laughs> and uh, what's that other freak? Uh, what's it, Sir? Sir Les Patterson. Oh, well, yeah. uh, not so much him, but the contents of his right trouser leg. <laughs> Side out part of me. Yes. Well, listen. Uh, but uh, we da. Uh, we da. Uh, what's the other? That chap that keeps getting dressed up as a woman. Uh, uh, Harry Bumphrey. No, you mean, you mean you mean Barry Humphreys? Oh, Barry. There's another pushback. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, he he's going around giving him the impression that all Australian politicians are drunk eight hours a day. And that's a lie, because it's more like 12. <laughs> or in Goff's case, 18, I think. I and, made uh, him a dame. This, 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 yeah, yeah, so keep taking the tablets, you'll be all right in a week, Goff. And uh, another thing, he, this Harry Bumphrey's a suggestion yeah, that uh, every Australian male over the age of 45, has had his prostate nipped out. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a lie, because in Woi Woi, no doctor in the last 180 years has ever taken out a man's prostate. And I'll tell you, well, he why? Do, they don't know where it is. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah, pardon. laughs> <laughs> what we'd like to know is why you don't have some decent cultural Australians on your programme, like... Uh, 
like our poet Henry Kendall. But he's dead. Yes, but on a programme like this, you wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> Then we've got Reg Waggle from <laughs> Reg Waggle from Patonga. <laughs> Don't laugh, he's a clever man. He's invented a new cheap hair transplant. <laughs> what he does is this: he takes the hairs from under your arms, then he puts it on top, and my word, it looks good. Is that anyone trouble? Sir. It stinks. <laughs> Commentary. <laughs> pass. Pass. I, I didn't know he was twins. <laughs> now, look, you may not know that Beethoven was born in Etalon. <laughs> yeah, Bruce Beethoven. <laughs> and he's uh, he's uh, he's written a, an anthem for war. Well, I'd like the people of this the, the, to get some culture tonight on this program, and I'd like to sing his anthem to war. Please yeah? do. I'll Please just do. stand up to give them a rest. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. <laughs> <laughs> there used to be bottles hanging off this before I got here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> There's... <laughs> There's a piece. <laughs> There's a peaceful land called Woi Woi <laughs> Where you never hear a sound Cause most of us folks in Woi Woi Are six feet underground <laughs> There's a lovely pub in Woi Woi Where there's plenty of fags and beer That's why we're the biggest graveyard in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> Make the announcements, Michael. All oh, right. Oh, well, that's all we've got time for. There's nothing oh, wrong to with the boy boy. Barry Tuckman has to spike Milligan, I think. I remind you, next week, my guest, uh, Billy Connolly, or June Salter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and Eddie Jordan, really from all of us here. <laughs> 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 <laughs>